Through the years, that's true. You know, I first met your pastor. We can switch that on there, buddy. There you go. Okay. I think it was 40 years ago in Michigan Bible Church. And I had basically, I was young, obviously. Good looking. Good looking. <laughs> I was kind of dumb, though. I'd just come out of Pentecostalism. And, you know, you look back. Is this too loud? No? no. Okay. And uh, you don't realize what years were formative sometimes until you, you've been done formed. Yeah. And uh, when I went to Michigan Bible Church, uh, I didn't know that much or anything. And I wasn't, you know, and I just want to really thank you, you, Pastor, because you really solidified me in the, King, in the final authority. And dispensationalism and all these things and told me, you know, about it, taught me to really, you really did set me on the right course. So I, you know, I appreciate that. And I, I look back over the years and you can see that. You know, I only had, we had babies then. Yeah. <laughs> Tell them, Brother Dave, your, your kids really tell you how old you're getting, you know. <laughs> so you last, you were like two. I've been in Florida for the last 12 years and I've been here back in Michigan for a couple, I guess. And, uh, Anyway, it's good to be back. It's good to be, my grandkids are all here, my family. Home is where your family is if you can do it. You know, so uh, I'm thankful. You know, and I wanted to, uh, I want to mention something else. There's something that happens, I think it happens to most Christians. I hope it does. And it's not, you know, maybe a spectacular miracle that's going to get you on the 700s club. Well, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but um, have you ever had the experience where, Oh, it's something like this. It doesn't have to be exactly like this. Maybe you can't sleep at night and you get up and you read a passage from the Bible, even if it's only a couple verses. And then the next day, at church or something, your pastor preaches on it. Yeah, yeah. You ever had that? Now, that's a great miracle. I mean, you can't, you can't make that up. I mean, and I think it, it doesn't happen all the time, but it happens enough to keep us, you know what? God's in control of this thing. He's doing it. Now, I've had that. some of those things happen, you know, Oh, probably a couple dozen times anyway throughout the last four decades, maybe more. I always appreciate it so much when they happen because you know you're really, you're at the right place. And it happened this morning. Now the pastor and I talked uh, at my house this week and he said, just say what you want or nothing. We didn't plan anything. We didn't plan anything. I said, okay. And I've never really done this before what I'm going to do today. But brother, I'm going to talk about contracts. You know, and I, when you read some of the verses you were reading, I, say, I just, I don't know, I, it's a dumb thing for a Christian to say, like, when you get an answer to prayer or something, you say, I can't believe this happened. <laughs> Do you say that? Yeah. Do you say, I mean, I pray, I get prayers answered a lot, and I always, when they happen, I'm always surprised. <laughs> and I go, oh, what a, you know, lack of faith jerk you are, you know. I even confess it to people. I can't believe that happened. And I've been praying for it for three years in front of people. And then there's my big testimony of faith. I can't believe God just did that. Amen. So anyway, i got to work on that. But I wanted to, uh, I'm going to be in Luke 16, but before we read anything from Luke 16, I'm going to, to show you that, I'm just not making this up. You know what I got here? No, I got a contract. And I'm going to pass this out. And uh, because there's an element of surprise. When Jesus gave this, there was an element of surprise. And, you know, Jesus, of course, it's a parable. And uh, Jesus, every time he taught, he taught with parables. And uh, sometimes I think parables are very undervalued. Yes. Jesus said when he'd speak in parables, he would reveal things that hadn't been revealed since the foundation of the world. So <coughs> that's pretty important. Yes. It's more than just, uh, you know good advice right. or uh, something like that. And we're going to talk about one in particular, but I'm going to, what I want you to do with this, I want you to use your imagination a little bit. And um, this is a contract, it's about money. So I want you to, it's, we're going to talk about the parable of the unjust steward. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I want you to imagine that I am the unjust steward. Now, I happen to work for the Jerusalem Savings and Trust. And you all have had, for one, what, one reason or another, I'm not going to embarrass anybody or call anybody out, but you had to get, maybe your furnace went out, maybe you, 
you know, maybe your missionary's furnace went out. But for whatever reason, you had to borrow some money from Jerusalem Savings and Trust. And you've agreed to uh, uh, pay $208 a month for the next two years. Yeah. This is the, your contract. I don't want this back. Pass it down, please. I just want you to look at, and I do want you to, uh, you get one too? You're in this thing. I, would you, does she read? That's fine. You can, I've got them. Um, where it says the debtor agrees to pay $208 a month. I just want you to go, run with me here. You borrowed it. I imagine you borrowed it. And you're the debtor. So I want you to put on the first line where it says January 1st, 2018, just initial that or pretend you initialed it or something. Don't initial it anywhere else. That uh, my initials are the, the unjust steward are there right below. I'm the chief officer of the bank, by the way. I'm the number two guy. I have full authority for everything the bank does. Because that's my job. Okay, now you get everybody? Everybody's got it? Oh, Linda, how can I <laughs> we'll give you one for Eddie, too. Okay. This is really a trip down memory lane to me. <laughs> We're all set. Okay. Yeah, it was my daughter. She had some issues today. I have a daughter who's, uh, Heather's 42. Wow, is it possible? <laughs> but Heather is in a wheelchair, and Heather had, has like a form of muscular dystrophy. And you, you know what, folks? There's some things only heaven's going to fix. That's right. Amen. And I don't back away from that at all. I'm not bitter about things. I get sadness, well, but sorrow is a uh, part of this. It take it. Sorrow does things to people no, but nothing else can do. Amen. So, and I personally, I'm not just just one rabbit. Let me tell you, there's, uh, you know, God's got it fixed up. So you just don't get too comfortable here. That's right. Amen. But listen, a thousand years from now, everything's just fine. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. That's right. It's true. <laughs> It's true. Amen. Okay. All right, here's the deal. You're strapped. You know, as you like most people, you're living from check to check, and you've agreed to pay this. Uh, if I hope you're, you, for on January 1st, you agreed to pay this uh, $208 a month, and we figured it out. And what, what I am, I'm not even charging interest. That's how, how good Jerusalem Savings and Trust is. Okay. And um, so you're paying it back, and then uh, you haven't even made a payment yet. <laughs> Careful, brother. <laughs> Careful. Um, but then suddenly you get a knock on your door. I mean, you've been talking with your your spouse and your kids. I mean, we're gonna. It's going to be kind of rough to pay this, but we're going to we're going to do it. And we're very grateful that we got over this because this helped us out a lot. I mean, we got our heat back on or whatever. Got the roof fixed. Right. And I knock on your door. And I say, listen. I'll pick on you. Listen, brother, brother Dan. I'm going to reduce your loan to 2500 No questions asked. All you have to do is sign there above the debtor. Right. Those are the new terms. And now you don't have to pay $208 anymore. You're just going to have to pay me 104 Now. I want you to look at that. I have full of, this is completely legal. You're talking to the first officer of uh, New Jerusalem Trust, or Jerusalem Savings and Trust. I have full authority to do everything I'm doing, all legal authority. Right. And I just propose to you, look, I'm reducing your loan. All you have to do is sign that document right here above debtor for the new terms, and it's done. All right, that's the start of this. That's how this sermon begins. <laughs> now, what are you going to do? You got, what you, I don't even want to know what you're going to do. Completely legal? What are you thinking? Luke 16. Right. Luke 16. I'm going to pray first. Father, I pray that uh, 
And thank you for this, for the, this congregation that's here today. And I pray, Lord, you look down from heaven and see, and you uh, prepare our hearts to hear uh, from the words of God. Amen. The scriptures, Lord, that you have preserved. Accomplish with those words what you would in our hearts. And we're so thankful for your word. We're so thankful that uh, we are allowed to hear, read the sermons that your son preached. Yes. What an honor that is. And we're thankful for the confirmation that uh, you give to us uh, as blessings that uh, you really are going to meet with us and you really are going to uh, change our lives. And Lord, the biggest prayer here is I pray that we're a little more like Jesus Christ when we leave this building than when we came in. And if there happens to be anyone here, Lord, that does not yet know you as your Savior, I pray that th today is the day that that decision is made. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so if you're at Luke 16, I'm going to read. And he said also unto his disciples, there was a certain rich man which had a steward, and the same was accused unto him that he had wasted his goods. And he called him and said unto him, How is it that I hear this of thee? Give an account of thy stewardship. For thou mayest be no longer steward. Then the steward said within himself, What shall I do? For my Lord taketh away my, me the stewardship. I cannot dig. To beg I am ashamed. I am resolved what to do, that when I am put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. So he called every one of the Lord's debtors unto him, and said unto the first, How much owest thou, my Lord? And he said, A hundred measures of oil. And he said unto him, Take thy bill, and sit down quickly, and write fifty. <laughs> then said he to another, How much thou owest thou? And he said, A hundred measures of wheat. And he said unto him, Take thy bill, and write fourscore. And the Lord commended the unjust steward. Commended, that is, he complimented him, because he had done wisely. For the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. And I say unto you, make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, that when ye fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. If therefore you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now I believe this parable is completely applicable and doctrinally applicable to the church as well as to the Jews. Now, all parables aren't like that. Right, right. But this one is. Yes, and, I, and if you don't agree with that right away, well maybe you will in a second, or maybe a couple minutes. Now this is a difficult parable. I mean, some people just throw their hands up. And, and this, is, uh, this is one of those places in the scripture, and there are several, that every time I get to it, if I read the Bible through, you have, maybe, you do, maybe you do this too. I say, man, I just don't understand this, Lord. And I pray about it. What is going on here, Lord? I mean, we can, and after all is said and done, I mean, the, the chief steward just ripped off his boss. You ever been ripped off by somebody? Do you say, thanks a lot, man, for doing that. You're really cool for doing that. I'm glad you ripped me off. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's what this rich guy just did. Right, right. He commands him. I said, that, that just doesn't make sense. And then he says, you know, well, okay. Now, there's, some, there's a few things, there's a few other things that are interesting to me about this parable as it started to unravel. Look at verse 4. Brenda, who's, Brenda's here? Oh, she's a, okay. Well, she's a, uh, she knows a lot about grammar in English. Well, I am resolved what to do that when I am put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. All right. Who is they? Right. Who is they? We're going to call on you, English teacher. We're in verse 4. 
We're looking at the pronoun they, which has been introduced, and the unjust debtor has said they uh, will uh, put me, let me use their houses, what, what happens. But who is they? Now, usually when a, when a pronoun is used, we look for something called the antecedent. So what that means is something must have come before that that what they represents, or the pronoun represents. The boy ran down the street, he was chasing his ball. The he rep goes back to the boy. All right. Now, you can get a more complicated sentence, and I guess we could say that this is that they, because there's been no they introduced yet, unless, mm -hmm. ladies and gentlemen, we go up to the verse 1, and he said also unto his disciples. Mm -hmm. All right. That's technically not part of the parable. But it's a very important part of the introduction because the disciples are who this parable is for. Right, right. Mm -hmm. The disciples are who this parable is for. Right. Now, I want you to turn to Romans 8.12. Keep, keep your place in uh, Luke 16 because we're going back. This is about the three main characters in this. There's three characters in this uh, parable, really. It's uh, the unjust steward, uh -huh. the debtors, and you. Because you're a disciple. Now, and the rich man. Romans 8.12, therefore, brethren, our apostle, therefore, brethren, we are debtors. I like to, I like to let the Bible interpret itself. Who's the debtors? You are. You are. Okay, that's, we're starting to flesh out this parable. 1 Thessalonians 5.5. 5. Because we're going to talk about, in 1 Thessalonians 5.5, 5, and you might want to jot this down on the back of your contract, ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. So what we've proved is that the Christian is a debtor and the Christian is a child of the light. Now, we're going to, with that information, let's go back and consider this parable some more. Why? We know who the parable is to. It's to the disciples. And we know that uh, the disciples are debtors. Now we know that the unjust steward has been told that he's going to lose his job. He knows he's going to lose his job. And this also tells you something about the, the rich man. Because the rich man is concerned about his goods. He is concerned about the way people take care of his possessions. He's going to fire the chief steward. Yeah. So that kind of even makes it more of a conundrum. Right. Why he once he finds out that uh, his chief steward just ripped him off, why is he commending him? Why is he complimenting him? Now that's a puzzle. Now that's a puzzle. Okay. So we got to ask the right questions. Now I want to read the parable again. And all our focus now is on the debtors. And here's the big question. How do the debtors react to the new contract? Right. Now, I passed out a contract in the beginning here. And we imagined that we borrowed $5,000. I don't think anybody has trouble imagining that. But you might have trouble imagining the bank, the chief steward from Chase Bank or wherever you borrowed money, or maybe it's a personal rich guy you know, comes in and says, you know what? You only owe half of that. Now, here's my question. 
Did you just sign? Did you agree to those terms? It's perfectly legal. Or did somebody say, did somebody say, well, wait a minute. You know, that's not my money. Right. I mean, I really am grateful right. for what you did. But shouldn't, uh, how does uh, the bank feel about that? Yeah, exactly. You know? This is the last day on the job for the, for the unjust steward. Uh, tomorrow, he's not going to have legal authority to do something like this. Right. The contract is legal, but the contract is immoral. And, disi and disciples face stuff like that all the time. There's lots of stuff in this world that is legal, right. but it's immoral. Right. We don't even have to talk about that. Right. Okay, now that, now it's starting, okay. You see, the parable, first of all, I think the, the parable is wrongly named. I think you should remember it as the unjust debtors. I don't think it should be remembered as the unjust steward. That's my opinion. Okay. All right, let's keep going here. We see, uh, now verse 9, though. I say unto you, who's he talking to? I say unto you, he's back talking to the disciples. Right. See, the parable's over. Make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, that when ye fail... When you die or you end, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. All right, again, we're looking for they. What's the antecedent of they? Who's going to receive me into everlasting habitations? That's got to be talking about eternity, everlasting. Okay, the they are the corrupt bargains, the deals that Christians make throughout their life, the, the breaking of the contract that follow you into everlasting habitations. This, this kind of stuff gets straightened out at the judgment seat of Christ. And I'm not talking this st about stuff you are genuinely, everybody's not on the same page on everything and everybody's not, no one's perfect, but there th are there things in life that you know you compromised. Right. Are there things, that, are there contracts you signed that you shouldn't have? And the contracts, what, what, what do you mean, but Pastor? What, what do you mean preaching about contracts? Well, you know what? There are contracts, you know. That we can start with uh, the Ten Commandments. No, I'm not trying to get anybody to keep the Sabbath. But you know what? All that other stuff's gone over by the great Apostle Paul. Doctrine for the church. Let's just start right here. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. <laughs> if there be any other commandments, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. And for Timothy, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, perjured persons, that there be anything, any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, and on he goes. Oh, you signed a contract, you know, when you got saved. If you've ever said to yourself, I want to be like Jesus, I'm going to try to be like Jesus, then, well, you just signed some contract stuff. And you know what? That's important. And the breaking of those contracts. And you, you add to that those laws. See, the law is sometimes easy compared to grace. You add to that being kind, being charitable, being considerate, being empathetic. That is putting yourself in somebody else's shoes so you can identify with what they're going through. Who do you help? Who do you make fun of? How many dirty jokes you uh, laugh at, participate in? Right. Oh man, it's endless. I'm not, and I'm not here to beat everybody up. Everybody's, you know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's that's the kind of stuff 
that follows you into everlasting habitation. That's why the Lord's Supper is so important. Right, right. So you can judge yourself. So you can you can fix that stuff up. That's I don't care what you're guilty of. You you confess you confess your sins, and He's faithful and just to forgive your sins, cleanse you from all unrighteousness, and you repent and you go on, and you won't have that stuff brought up at the judgment seat of Christ. That's what I believe. But all the stuff you don't have any intention of fixing follows you in everlasting habitation. And there might be more than, uh, you, you know, you should, everybody needs to take an inventory. Because a lot of times people as Christians say, you know, forgive me for my sins. Well, yeah. But I think sometimes what we mean is excuse us for our sins, you know. It's tough for me to, to get that. I, I don't want to do it, but I do it. You know, I'm, I'm guilty of that stuff. And that, uh, I think, is the they. Especially the stuff for money. I mean, money, money really flushes you out. The love of money. Okay. Now, real quickly, I want to show you something. See, you know what makes, it's not the unjust steward signature that made everything legal. It's not that the rich man, who is God in this parable, it's not that he respects the unjust steward. We've already known he's losing his job. Right. He respects the debtor. He respects the debtor's signature. That's what validates the contract. What is man that thou art mindful of him? I mean, the angels just got to look down and say, why don't you just stop that guy from doing that? Why don't you just stop that preacher? Well, God lets it go. It doesn't mean he forgot about it. It doesn't mean he cleared the guilty, right. even though you're going to heaven, don't tell me the judgment seat of Christ isn't going to be a nightmare. Right. Right. That's what I believe. What's following you into everlasting habitations? I want you to turn real quick to uh, Deuteronomy 7. 1 through 5, a passage that the pastor used. Deuteronomy chapter 7. Now, here's a contract. Verse 1, When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land whither thou goest to possess it, and has cast out many nations before thee. Pastor read this. This is a contract that the Jews made but before going into the land. And I'm, I'm, what I'm bringing this up for again is because we have a perfect example of the unjust debtor's contract in the Bible. And it's absolutely perfect. Right, right. It's absolutely perfect. All right. So <clears throat> there's seven nations. And when the Lord thy God shall deliver thee from before thee, thou shalt smite them and shall utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. For, for a host of reasons, these tribes needed to be judged. Right. I mean, there was something genetically wrong with them, probably. But anyway, speaking of giants. But they made a, he, God warned them, said, don't make a covenant with these people. Because the covenant, he told these people that were in that land, I want, I want you to turn to Joshua chapter 9. He told those people that they had, you know, the Jews weren't the first owners of the Holy Land. Right, right. There's something special about that land, there's no doubt about it. But he waited, he had these people there, and he said, you can no longer be stewards of this land. You're, I'm throwing you guys, the Amorites and the Perizzites and the... Amorites and all these other ites, the Hittites and the Canaanites. He says, you've lost it. Just like he did in the parable of the unjust steward. He says, you may no longer be stewards of my land. You're done. I'm bringing in new occupants. They're called Hebrews. 
Okay? Now, in Joshua chapter 9, you're gonna, some of you are going to know this story. The inhabitants of Gibeon, when they heard, you know, they heard about what happened to Jericho and they, when Joshua brought them in and they heard these, the Jews seemed invincible and they heard about this and the, and the Gibeonites, now the Gibeonites are the unjust steward. I want you to think about this. They say to themselves, we're in big trouble here. The gig is up. God has decided that we can no longer have our job. So what are we going to do? Somebody says, I know what we can do. We're going to do something deceitful. And we're going to lie. And we're going to change the contract. We're going to go to the Jews. We're going to go to the Hebrews. And we're going to say, we're going to get them to sign a new contract. Like the contract you got. And you see, it's not that the Jebusites... God respected the Jebusites. Or the Gibeonites, excuse me. The Gibeonites. He respects the Jews. He respects Israel's signing on their dotted line. Now let's read this real fast. And when the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done unto Jericho and to Ai, they did work wily and went and made as if they had been ambassadors and took old sacks upon their asses and wine bottles, old and rent and bound up, and old shoes and clouded upon their feet, and old garments upon them, and all the bread of their provision was dry and moldy. And they went to Joshua unto the camp at Gilgal and said unto him and to the men of Israel, We be come from a far country. Now therefore make ye a league, or a contract, with us. And the men of Israel said unto the Hivites, Peradventure you dwell among us, how shall we make a league with you? And they said unto Joshua, We are thy servants. And Joshua said unto them, Who are you? And from whence come ye? And they said unto him, From a very far country. The servants came, Come because of the name of the Lord thy God. For we have heard the fame of him and all that he did in Egypt and all that he did to the two kings of the Amorites that were beyond Jordan to Sion king of Heshbon and to Og king of Bashan which was at Ashtroth wherefore our elders and all the inhabitants of our country spake to us saying take victuals with you for the journey and go to meet them and say unto them we are your servants therefore now make a league with us this our bread we took for our provision out of our houses on the day we came forth to, to go unto you but now behold it is dry it is moldy Verse 13, And these bottles of wine which were filled were new. Behold, they be rent. These are our garments and our shoes. They are become old by reason of a very long journey. And the men took their victuals and asked not counsel at the mouth of the Lord. And Joshua made peace with them and made a league with them to let them live. And the princes of the congregation swear to them. That contract I passed out? The Jews signed it when it came to the Gibeonites. Right. And God honors that contract for the next 600 years, brothers. Right. Right. Six, those people weren't supposed to be there. And it's not because the Gibeonites were honored. It was because of who signed the contract. The Lord's debtors signed the contract. Right. Now, I'll finish one thing. I don't want to keep you too long. I, I, I will finish one thing. This, in this parable, the unjust steward, in the parable now, is Satan himself. And there's several places in Scripture where God commends the devil after he's fallen. Thou art wiser than Daniel. Thou art perfect. He's the only creature God ever called perfect. In wisdom. He says, Thou art perfect in wisdom. <coughs> He's commended him. Now, does this fit in? Did the devil change a contract? Oh, he sure did. There's a little story about Adam and Eve. Eating from a tree they're not supposed to. Because the devil comes to him and lies to him. And when Adam and Eve signed that contract, <laughs> They let the devil move right into their house. Right. They made, that devil was not, going to, was not supposed to be the god of this world. Right. He is now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. He was not to have, supposed to have the power of death. He does now. Mm -hmm. 
that's it exactly when that contract was signed. And not because the devil, God respected the morality of the devil. He respected Adam and Eve. He didn't respect the Gibeonites. He respected the Hebrews, Joshua, and the tribal leaders. That's what verified the contract. And to this day, the debtors are his disciples. And when they validate a contract, you know what? There's consequences for bad deals. And don't go through life thinking that everything's legal. It's right. That's getting less and less, actually. It's getting less and less. Let's pray. Father, I'm thankful that I've had this opportunity to teach on the unjust debtors. I pray, Lord, that if I've said anything that's uh, from my own flesh, I pray that people forget it quickly. But I pray, Lord, if these are good and wise words, that we remember them and we change them and we reflect on things that we do as we go through this life. Thank you for everything you've done for us, Lord. Thank you most of all for saving us. Thanks for putting up with us. Show us where we're wrong. Show us where we fail. If perchance we don't see it, show us that. Make us like Jesus, Lord. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Thank you very much for listening. Amen.